Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's webinar, Powering AI in the Enterprise. A quick background about myself, uh, I'm Yogesh, I'm the founder and CEO of Inferix. I have around almost like 18 to 20 years of experience in building data management and analytics applications for large enterprises. Um, been working in multiple industries like ranging from finance, healthcare, hospitality and many others. Uh, I carry a very strong passion of building technology solution and products. Um, let's move to the next slide. Uh, just a quick overview about Inferix. Inferix is a global analytics consulting company. Uh, we help enterprise to build AI ML solutions using our low code management platform, uh, which helps in terms of data management and analytics both front. Today's agenda is uh, we are going to talk about what is AI. Then we are going to look at a, a high level architecture. Then we can look at an example uh, followed by the technology stack that is being used. Um, then we'll talk about some real world challenges and then we'll have a quick demo of AIML application followed by question and answers. So what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is basically, um, you know, it's a computer performing a human task. So there are many tasks that are performed by humans, which are very manual in nature. Uh, so in the early days, you know, all those tasks which are uh, done by humans and now done by computers was, was a process of automation. Uh, artificial intelligence goes one step beyond automation with where it not only automates the task uh, which are like uh, which are performed by humans but also it learns from the human experience and models in such a way where it can do an intelligent processing uh, for a better outcome so there are various areas within artificial intelligence the most commonly discussed are the machine learning and the deep learning so machine learning is basically where uh, you know there are various algorithms that are available uh, and there are types of machine learning algorithms like supervised and supervised. Um, it's, it's in a supervised algorithm, it's mainly about uh, training a model using label data. So the, it's, it's like, you know, you put the data into an algorithm, you build a model out of it and the model, the, the data already contains a label. So there is a known, there is, a, there is in, uh, enough information within the data for the algorithm to learn and then predict all the future out events. Okay, unsupervised learning on the contrary does not have any uh, pre-labeled information and hence it kinds of learns uh, out of the data and generates predictions. Deep learning is beyond machine learning. So there are many problems like, you know, basic problems which are like classification, clustering, regression. They are covered in the machine learning algorithms. If you want to do something more advanced, which involves uh, like, you know, using like neural networks, artificial neural networks or convolutional neural networks, uh, they are mainly used in the areas of computer vision or image detection and uh, like, you know, video analytics and few other use cases. So it's more for an advanced stage. You need a lot more data as compared to machine learning uh, because deep learning is purely based upon the amount of data that you have. Now, there are many applications of AI in the area of speech detection, vision, NLP, RPA. These are various applications where you can use these machine learning and AI algorithms to build your applications. Here is the high level architecture. Uh, now this is a very standard reference architecture that is used in industry where uh, there are on the, it goes from left to right. So there are various core systems that are available. Uh, you know, there are front office systems where your transactions takes place. There is CRM system, which is customer relationship management system where your customer data is maintained and the whole journey and the life cycle of customer finance data, HR data, and few other external sources. So these external sources can be social media data and so on, like Facebook and Twitter. So the, the first step is really to collect the data from these various source systems and bring into an enterprise data lake. Uh, before you want to really run any kind of, build any kind of AI application, you need to make sure that all the data is collected and gathered in one location, which is typically called an enterprise data lake. Um, and then once you receive this data, then you know, you can cleanse the data, you can quality check it, you can profile this data to make sure you understand what are the characteristics of the data. And once the data is available to be consumed, then it can be consumed by various application layers. So as you see, there is three different layers here, L1, L2, L3. L3 being where, uh, you know, you can have one or many applications consuming the data from the standardized data layer. Now to do all of this, obviously you need a bunch of components uh, that you either need to buy or build uh, at your enterprise. So the first component is really the data ingestion, which allows you to pull data from these various sources and put into a staging area. Then there is data quality engine, which allows you to run quality checks to make sure the quality of the data is good. 
And then once you're satisfied with it, then you can profile this data to understand what kind of information it contains, and then finally prepare this data so that it can be consumed. So the first four steps are all related to pure data management. Uh, once the data management tasks are done, then obviously you can start with the consumption. Now the consumption is, is in the form of applications. This could be very basic applications like reporting and dashboard, and they can be as advanced as, uh, you know, like uh, building a machine learning or AI model or uh, running a rule engine. So there are various other things you can do. The typical AI applications, which companies or enterprise, they kind of embark upon in the early stages is really related to the customer 360 degree where you know they, things like customer churn prediction and things like that. Uh, recommendation engine, which is more towards the product, where you want to make sure that uh, you recommend the right product uh, to the to the customer, like more from a upsell or a cross cross sell perspective. Um, and then you also have like price optimization and fraud detection. So fraud detection is falling more under the compliance side of it, but you know, um, and the price optimization is for your product pricing. You want to have some kind of dynamic pricing going on based upon the the events that are happening around the customer or the location the customer is in, based upon that, you can do some predictions. So obviously this is not the full list of applications that can be uh, created, uh, but these are this is just a list that is most commonly built in the initial days. Now to do all of this, you need, a, uh, apart from the data management components, you would also require uh, analytics components, which is like, you know, you want to do data visualization to do data exploration. You would require knowledge graphs if you want to restructure your data in a graph form and then do a th like a network analysis. You would require machine learning libraries to do any kind of predictive modeling and then deep learning for something which is more advanced than machine learning. Okay. Moving on, uh, this is a typical AI ML application flow uh, where you can see, you know, the first step is really to collect the source, the data from various sources and put into a data. I mean, it's a data collection process, which is typically handled by the technology team like ETL developers. Uh, and, you know, like this is uh, done using some kind of homegrown, homegrown framework or maybe some kind of standard ETL tool like Informatica or Talent, something like that. Uh, once the data collection task is done, then, then the next step is like to hand over the, the data to the business users or the analytics users who would do some kind of data exploration. So data exploration is all about um, like, you know, looking at the, the columns, the, the, all the columns in the table, the values in it, uh, to just understand the distribution of the data, what are the anomalies in the data, what are the uh, like, you know, gaps in the data. Because once you do an exploration, I mean, that is where you spend bulk of your time. Once you understand your data well, then you know a short sort strategy, uh, what kind of algorithm you want to use, what are the deficiencies in the data, because different algorithms require different characteristics of the data, right? If your data is too small and there are many columns, then you may use one type of algorithm versus another and so on. So understanding your data is really like the first step before you start building a machine learning model. Um, model development is typically done in an enterprise by, as I said, the analytics user, the data science community. So uh, the first step is really to train your model and then create a model out of it. So once the algorithm is trained, it, it develops a model. Uh, once the model is developed, then the next step is really to test the model. So let's say if you have, uh, you know, like uh, X amount of data. So out of that X amount, you will set aside like 80% for training and 20% for testing, just to see how your model is performing on the data that the, that the, which is not seen by your model to begin with. So that's the model testing part. And then, you know, once you know that uh, after the testing, you would come to know what is the accuracy of the data, then you will start tuning the model to achieve a better accuracy. Now, a tuning can be a very iterative process. It may happen as a part of model development. Sometimes you may have to wait a couple of months uh, to get fresh data and feedback from the previous prediction so that you can tune the model. Right. So there are really two aspects. One is a point in time tuning and then another is like a periodic tuning. So once the model is ready, then it's handed over to the technology team who are going to implement the model. Again, there'll be another tool or technology involved where they will be implementing this model. Um, and, you know, obviously, once the model is implemented, we will have to monitor the model, do a reporting in the model in terms of usage stats. Uh, so once the, uh, maybe initially if the model, while the model was developed, it was developed in some kind of R script or a Python script, it may not be the most viable way to implement right away as is. In that situation, there would be situations where we might have to rewrite this uh, model in a different language or 
uh, to you know to kind of be more conducive with the environment and the technologies that are available in the production environment okay uh, then this once the model is implemented then these outcomes are kind of integrated into they flow into an application scheme uh, and once it goes into an application then it gets exposed to the business users then they take a shot on it whether this prediction was correct inaccurate or maybe partially correct this feedback that comes from the business users can then be fed back into the model training process which where you see this feedback loop going into the model training process and then you can fine tune your model so this is what i was talking about the periodic tuning so point in time tuning is really like when uh, the model is built initially there are quick tricks that you can apply by changing some parameter doing some hyper tuning and you can gain some benefit but in the long run you kind of try to rely more on the fresh data that is coming and the feedback loop that really helps your model to tune to the next level uh here is an example of a, you know uh, an ai ml solution this is an aml fraud detection platform or an architecture of it um so typically the way fraud detection happens in large enterprises it's through a rule engine um ai ml has been they have been started using ai ml very recently uh, i would not say there is a 100% success to it but you know they have taken the first step towards it so traditionally what happens is uh, on the blue boxes you can see these are the various source system that is that is feeding data into the data lake so we have front office system sending the transactions kyc system sending your customer data and then you have like watch list coming from the government and the external sources could be like social media data so as i mentioned before all the data gets into a repository this repository could be a data warehouse it could be a data lake it could be some database right um, and then once this information comes into the lake then it can be either fed into a rule engine which will run some uh, scenarios and uh, under some thresholds and generate some alerts so that's one way of generating the fraudulent alert because aml is a fraud detection scenario we are trying to um, identify the fraudulent transactions okay but again there is no ai or machine learning algorithm being used as a part of rule engine it's a pretty static flat way of looking at the data and you try to look for the same criteria over and over a period of time uh, now if you want to do something more advanced you want to use advanced analytics engine then we then comes the role of the ai ml where the same data can now be fed into the uh, the analytics engine which will perform all the feature calculation then you would train a model and then finally generate the predictions and push it to the uh, alert management system where you want to triage those alerts so you could be generating your alerts from the rule engine as well as from the analytics engine you can combine them together create a uh, composite score and then kind of look into it because i don't think so any enterprise on day one would go and just replace their existing system so i think there would always be uh, a parallel system running like a you know ai ml engine along with your rule engine which will uh, you know kind of contribute to your alert scores and just make it give more priority to the alerts which needs to be looked upon okay so what happens is like as i said there is a feedback loop involved from the alert management system so you have an, your analysts who are looking at the alerts these alerts the feedback goes back into the analytics engine and improves the model now within the analytics engine you can run multiple models it's it's not like you have to just run one model so typical the strategy is to run two or three different models one of them model which is like a tested model certified model is called a champion model and another could be a challenger model so challenger model is something which is like running along the sidelines of challenge uh, champion model which allows you to generate alternate predictions and then you know we can do a compare and contrast between the two if you feel the challenger model is producing better outcomes then the challenger model becomes the champion model and so on so this cycle keeps on repeating and this is one way of like doing an ab testing when you are having multiple models in production finally these alerts go into the alert case management which is nothing but an application and once this application receives all this all the analysis is being done there and then finally this data is sent to management reporting or regulatory reporting so this is a typical implementation of an ai ml solution uh, uh, within the you know a larger ecosystem let's talk about the technology stack like what technologies are used when you're building an ai ml platform uh so what do you really need is like um, you know obviously you receive your data from major data uh, rdbmss because that is where your operational data is sitting right your transaction data your customer data your product data and all the supplementary data around your transactions so you need your platform needs to be in a position to read data out of this platforms and and put that into a data lake which is typically a hadoop platform so it could be in and out between the rdbms and the big data platform 
sometimes if you're doing something more advanced using graph technology then you may also have to talk to a graph database which is like neo4j or apache spark so these are all the different type of data sources we may have to interact with uh, in terms of the processing, if you're processing large amounts of data as a batch process, then you may use Apache Spark. If you're doing something more real time, then Apache Kafka is more suitable out there. Uh, now, by no means, these are the only technologies you should be using. These are just examples or most commonly used technologies in the industry. If you were uh, now from a machine learning perspective, there are many machine learning libraries available. It is available in Spark. It is available in TensorFlow, R, Python, and there are many more out there. So, but these are the four commonly used libraries when it comes to the machine learning algorithms okay uh, all of this obviously can be you know implemented in cloud too so these are the technologies very commonly used technologies on the on any of these cloud platforms so let's look at some of the challenges that typically people face uh, the first challenge people would really face is the data formats so what happens is as i said your data is coming from various sources it could be structured data unstructured data semi-structured data so how, you cannot really take that data and pump into the algorithm and create a model out of it. It's not really that easy. So what you need to do is you have to cleanse this data. You have to make it into a readable format. So all this unstructured data have to get into some kind of structure before it can be supplied to the algorithm. Okay. So there are format inconsistencies and those things will have to be taken care, uh, you know, before you can start training the model. Um, second item is really the uh, data quality issues. This is typical for any, any application that is you know dealing with the data it's not really for a machine learning application but also for a, a reporting application this could be a concern so you want to make sure that you implement the good data quality process in your pipeline which kind of reveals all the anomalies in the data and then helps you kind of detect and fix right there and then uh, because there could be downstream impact if you don't fix this so some of the examples would be um, let's say uh, you know you have an imbalance in your data set so for example you are trying to solve a fraud detection problem and out of 100% of your data, only 1% of your data is really fraudulent and 99% non-fraud data. So there is a real imbalance in your data and this imbalance can create, uh, you know, accuracy problems or prediction problems in your model. They are not going to be that accurate. They're going to be very biased to the non-fraudulent predictions because 90% of your data that the model is trying to learn belongs to the non-fraudulent uh, non transactions. So you may want to identify these issues as a part of your data exploration. And then as a part of data quality, you will try to balance this data by doing some kind of sampling. So either, either you can downsample your non-fraudulent data to match with the fraudulent data, or you can upsample your fraudulent data to match with the number of records in the non-fraudulent side. So there are various techniques you can use. Um, from a data quality perspective, other issue would be like bias in the data. So you may be using some indicator which is highly correlated to your prediction, but it may be more of a bias. Uh, rather than really giving you the predicted power. So in that situation, you will be kind of, uh, you know, like uh, your accuracy will be very high and the impression would be that, that you have discovered a great model, but then it won't be very accurate when it comes to prediction. So you may want to remove any kind of biases out of your data before you start training the model. Okay. Uh, data labeling is another scenario where you are receiving data, but it's not correctly labeled and incorrect labeled data can lead to incorrect predictions. So that's a very common problem. So as a part of uh, follow up to your data quality process, when you profile your data, you should be able to identify these issues uh, much ahead in your pipeline. Um, and if you're, and there could be scenarios where you have data, but there are no labels out there. And in that scenario, you may want to hire a team who could manually go and label all your data. Uh, I believe there are also tools and technologies available out there which can help you auto label this as long as you supply some initial sample of labels. You know, like if you have like, like a, let's a million record, it might take a very long time to sit and label every record. So you can label a sample of it and then use those samples to use machine learning to label the rest of your data. So there are some techniques that can be used out there. Model interpretation is another uh, aspect of uh, model, uh, predictive modeling application where you want to, uh, let's say you have built a model, the model has a very good accuracy, and now you want, to, you want to ship these predictions to your business users. So once they receive these predictions, how would they know that why the model has really predicted A or B or C? So you have to kind of supply or back it up with the features that were involved in making that decision. Understand that the model is uh, features, you know, model is built using features, right? That is the input to the model. So now these features, are responsible for these predictions. 
but which feature is responsible more than the other one has to be kind of explained you know you know kind of exposed and only then one can interpret the results of the model so there are very specific libraries available out there like lime is one of the library in python which allows you to run your uh, you know calculate the feature weights against your predictions and for every prediction you make through the model it will give you what is the weight for each of the features in making their prediction so that kind of allows the business user to focus on a certain feature uh, rather than you know kind of trying to dig out what would have really happened for this prediction because knowing that this is a fraudulent transaction is one thing but knowing that why this fraudulent transaction has happened is another thing right and once you know why it has happened uh, in future you can try to control that aspect of fraud so that you know because the goal is not to identify more and more frauds right because you're losing business you're losing credibility so you want to control the fraud also but to control the fraud you need to know why the fraud happened in the first place that's what i'm trying to say uh large scale data processing technology integration these are all technical issues where you want to make sure that uh, when you are in the model development phase you might choose to use non standard technologies or non scalable technologies because you are more focused on building the model but then down the line when the model has to be implemented on the full scale of data it might be creating issues it may have performance problems the library may not be able to scale up and so on so if you can pick the right tools and technologies earlier in the path it would be much better rather than choosing it later okay so otherwise there will be a lot of rewriting that the technology team has to do and that can be easily avoided which is like saving time and money okay let's do a quick demo now uh, so we are going to show you uh, uh, an end to end ai ml application how is it built using inferix analytics platform uh, this is a platform we use for our customers to build the applications so i'm going to show you an application which is um, in uh, it's called employee attrition or it's more of a domain of hr analytics so let me choose this so just to give a quick intro about the inferix analytics platform it's a is basically a platform that we have built at inferix and we use this platform as a part of our services with our clients uh, to build applications okay so the, there are two major components to the platform data management and analytics data management can help you to do everything to do with like bringing your data cleansing your data profiling quality checking preparing etc and okay so that's the data management then once the data is prepared then you can use other analytical components of the platform like you know machine learning or reporting dashboarding uh, or creating knowledge graphs and so on there are many things you can do we also have a rule engine which allows you to write, write rules and you know generate alerts or some kind of predictions but obviously they are very static in nature so but the platform has all the components you know all the ingredients that allows you to build this app so the goal of this platform is to allow the enterprises uh, which include both it and business users to create the whole application in a very collaborative way okay so let's look at a high level uh, picture of this application so i'm going to take you from a top down approach where uh, so this is an end to end pipeline uh, which is basically predicting uh, employee attrition attrition is nothing but which employee is going to leave in the upcoming months so we run this application once a month and try to predict which employee is going to be uh, there is a possibility of leaving the organization in the upcoming month right because employee attrition is a huge problem and it's a very time it's a very expensive problem to have so what is the first step i mean as we saw in the slide before the first step was really to bring in the data right so if you see here the first icon which is the black icon that allows you to build the data so these are data ingestion jobs where we are bringing historical data and then pumping into the database before we can start any kind of analytics so we are bring, bringing this data from like we are receiving this data in the form of files from the source system and then these files are fed into the in on to the data lake in the big data platform using the data ingestion job okay so there are two data ingestion jobs there one is the historical another is incremental a uh, historical is basically to load all your history data like you know we have almost like 24 months of history here and then we do receive like monthly incremental data which is kind of fed here okay so once the data is all the data is loaded the next step is really to to prepare your data right so all the 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 purple icons over here they allow you to these are mappings etl mappings which are configured to read this data and do some joins do some aggregations and finally put your data in a standard form you know in a more integrated fashion once the data is loaded then we calculate the feature data set so feature data set is basically um, with the help of feature engineering techniques we have come up with a list of features 
that we want to put into the model. Uh, so there's a lot of calculations involved to create the features. Okay, we'll go over some of the features when I'll show you the model definition, that what kind of features we have built here. Uh, once the feature is built, then you want to prepare the data for training. So we kind of calculate features for the full set of data. In this case, like let's say two years. And then when we want to train the model, as I said before, we make a split. So we keep like 18 months of data for training and then six months of data for validation. So the first 18 months of data has been used. So we've kind of filtered the data here and load the data for 18 months. Once that is done, then we can train the model. So the model training definition is here. And then finally you see there is another mapping which allows to prepare the data for validation. And once the data is prepared for validation, we evaluate the model using the validation data. Okay. Once all that is done, then final step is really to build the dashboards and reports and you know, kind of expose it to the management or sh uh, share it with the management. So you can see that you know, this platform is really allowing you to build all the steps together on a single platform. And these are very critical functions of building an AI ML application, right? I mean, you might think building an AI ML application is like writing a, some piece of code in the notebook, but that's not enough when you want to implement such a solution. So it may be a great model, but if you want to really talk holistically, it should really start all the way from uh, bringing in the data, cleansing the data, preparing the data, calculating the features, training the model, evaluating it, and then displaying it, okay? So this is what exactly I'm kind of trying to depict here. Now we can look at some of these components individually. So for example, let's run, jump right into data science. This is a module that is available as a part of the platform. Uh, so we have around like 23 or so algorithms. These algorithms are a combination of Spark, R, Python, TensorFlow. We have used all sorts of libraries depending upon the best of the breed. So the platform is not really writing its own algorithm. The platform is only in allowing you to integrate with the open source libraries out there. Uh, and if you have anything, something which is written in-house, we can also integrate to that. There are some standards that we need to follow before you can integrate the algorithm in the platform. Uh, these pla the algorithms are a combination of like various techniques like you know regression techniques, classification, clustering, neural networks. So all sorts of techniques are available for you to use to build your models. Uh, I can show you one of the example algorithms. So this is an XGBoost classifier algorithm, which is, class which is tagged as a classification algorithm. It's a Python library. And it, there is a script it is pointing to, which is kind of, uh, you know, uh, the backbone, you know, of the algorithm. And then obviously if each algorithm, you have to send a, uh, a lot of parameters from a tuning perspective, from a configuration perspective. So there is a concept of building a parameter list and then supplying it to the algorithm to build a model. So here we are able to like kind of configure the parameter list. The list is already created here. I can show you a quick glance of a list. So for the same algorithm that we were looking at, the XGBoost classifier, this is the corresponding list. And this has got a whole bunch of parameters that we are supplying while training the model, okay, or while training the algorithm. Now, these are all the default values. Obviously, you can change them, you can replicate it, and you can kind of make another copy and change it. Depending upon your requirement and scenario, you may have you know, more of one list. Uh, once the list is prepared, the algorithm is in place, then comes really building the model. So let's look at one of the models here. This is the XGBoost classifier model. I'm choosing Python over here. These are the various options available in terms of what type of algorithm can you choose or library can you choose. For this algorithm, for this library, you can see that um, we are choosing. So these are all the algorithms available in the Python library. Uh, Okay, so these are all the algorithms available. You can choose one of these, you can decide what you want to. So here we are just defining what is going to be the label in the model and what are the features. So if you see the features are age, gender, designation, department, and there are some calculated features like what is the mean CTC, what is the citizen comparison to at a department level, designation level, and so on. And there are also something like percentile. These all features we have computed using the data preparation package and then kind of you know like configured here to be used. Now, some of these, as you see, when you are trying to build a machine learning model, some of the values are numeric, some are uh, strings. So if you have any string column, which is also called a categorical column, then you may want to encode those categorical columns. So there are various encoding techniques available. In this case, I'm using one hot, but you can choose label encoding, target encoding, whatever encoding technique is uh, making sense. Um, also, if you like to impute the data, like, you know, it's quite possible that Sometimes your data may have blank values in it. Ideally, you should handle them upstream, like in the data management process. 
But if for some reason you end up receiving blank data, there is an option here where you can impute the data using a standard value, uh, like a fixed value, or you can even use a function. If it's a numeric column, you can say, you know, take an average or take a min or max of that column. Okay, this is how you build a model. Once the model is built, then you can go and train the model. So while training, you will have to make a selection of the data. So model is an empty container, right? And if you want to do a hyper tuning, you can say yes. Once you choose hyper parameter tuning, then when you execute the, the when you try to train the model, it's going to prompt you a, a, a parameters which are related to hyper params, okay? Uh, now uh, over here, you come and choose your model, the model that we just created. You choose your data, the source data, the and you now have to map all the columns, right? So which column in your data is a label column, which column is a feature column and so on. So all the features are being mapped here. Also, we kind of ask you what is a row identifier, which is nothing but a primary key on your data, a key column. It could be customer ID, it could be employee ID, codes, it could be a combination of things and so on. Once the mapping is done, then you, you go to the final screen where it asks you a few other questions, like you want to save the features. So when you try to generate the output, you may want to save the input features as a part of your output, then you can make the selection. Calculate feature weight is, uh, the, this is the model interpretability part I was talking about where you want to run the line package to calculate weights on every predictions for the features. That is a optional step because obviously it takes some extra time, but this is something that is available. Finally, you may want to choose whether you want to save the data in a file format or do you want to put into a table? These are the two options available and you can choose a table accordingly. In our system, we call data pod, a table as a data pod. Uh, you can overwrite, uh, you can de de for divide the data. You can normally do 70, 30, 80, 20. This is just a test uh, we are performing here. So the ratio is 99 is to one. Uh, sometimes you have to do sampling. The, this is what I was talking about when I was mentioning about data quality issues where you have uh, unbalanced data sets, right? So if you have imbalanced data sets, then you may want to scale up and there are techniques to scale up or scale down your data, random techniques, mod technique, and a few others. Right now, these are the two techniques available, available in the platform. Uh, finally, you can provide a seed and then, you know, kind of save your model. Uh, this is not the model, but the train configuration. Once the train configuration is done, then you can execute it, which is like training the model. And then over there, you can choose the param list that we created. And if you want, you can make changes to it. These are all the default values, uh, but obviously you can go and just change these things. Uh, once that is done, okay. Just a small hiccup here. Uh, so now what you can do is once the training is done, then we can look at the results. Um, so this is the results of the training. Okay, so this particular model, you see there are 22 features. There were 50,000 or so records, but since there was uh, an imbalance in the data set, I've used a sampling algorithm, which has kind of upsampled it and kind of equated both the attrition versus non-attrition records. Okay, there are two classes in this data. Uh, then we can look at the feature weights. Feature weights are nothing but when you, after you train the model, depending, uh, I mean, based upon the characteristic of your training data, uh, it's going to compute the weightage on each of the features. So as you see here, the fixed CTC per annum has got a 28% weight, which means 20, like out of your total predictions, 28% is kind of dependent on this particular column. So it's a very key column. As you see, there are like 22 features, but this particular one is taking like 28% weight on it. So this must be a very critical column in making the prediction. Now, this is based upon the data for the, you know, for a company A, but a company B may have different set of characteristics in the data and these features may just go up and down, you know? I mean, their top feature could be something else versus another company. So it's not really depending upon the problem, it depends on your data. That's all I'm trying to say. In terms, then we can look at the performance charts. Here we can see the confusion metrics, you can see the accuracy of the model, you can see the ROC curve. Uh, there are These are some quick things that you would like to focus upon when you're training the model. Uh, and then how many predictions were made in both in terms of one and zero, which is nothing but attritions versus non-attritions. You can look at the data that was used for training. As I said, there was a flag when you, when we kind of configure to train, which allows you to, uh, you know, say that, okay, please save the features. So if you see all the features that were present in the data were saved here, right? Uh, then we can look at the test data. So we did a split between the train and the test. So in the train tab, you can see all the train data. In the test tab, you can see the test part of it. 
uh, and obviously we are doing predictions on the test. So if you go to the back of it, you should be able to see the predictions that happened around it. So it will show you what is the label, which means nothing, the actual value and what are the probabilities on the prediction and also the prediction itself. So in this case, there are two classes and class zero and class one. So as you see the, for the first row, there is a 10% uh, probability versus 89%. Since 89% is more than 10%, obviously the result is one, so hence the prediction is one. So this kind of gives you an explanation of the probability. Typically the default threshold is 0.5, which is in the center. But if you want, for some reason, if you want to lower your thresholds up or down, you can do that. Uh, obviously be mindful that once you adjust your thresholds, all your metrics are going to change in terms of the accuracy number, the recall ratio, and so on. So there is like, a, it's a two-edged sword. You just have to kind of pick the right number for your data. Then we can look at the feature weights. Feature weights is something that I was talking about. Like in this case, for this particular employee, dummy 1152, uh, it's going to show you what is a prediction. So for this one, the prediction is one. And you can see all the features here. So earlier we saw the feature importance, which is a more generalized point of view uh, across all the data. Now we are looking at one specific record. So this was a record which got a prediction of one, which means uh, there is a tendency that employee is going to exit the organization. But now we want to know what is the reason. Why is the model thinking that it's going to be a prediction of one rather than zero? So the, here is the explanation. All of these features that you see in the orange, they have specific weights on it. And these features are kind of driving the model to predict in the direction of one, okay? So if, if the totality of this weight is more than 50%, then it's going to go in the direction of one. If, the, if there is more weightage on the blue bars, or the, or the features on the blue side, then you're going to be having a prediction of zero, okay? So this kind of tells me like the first, in this case you see like incentive amount. So maybe the, the reason for this uh, person to exit the, as per the model, the, the model is predicting the person is going to exit the company and seems the top reason could be the incentive amount. Maybe he got less incentive, maybe he did not get the incentive. That could be one of the reasons. Okay, so that's the feature weight part of it. So that's typically the model development life cycle. Now the next step is really the evaluation. Uh, just like model training, you will go and configure an evaluation uh, job where you will point to the model that you just trained and you're going to put a new set of data. So as I was saying before, uh, if you have two years of data, as an example, you can take 18 months for training, six months for prediction, which is nothing but evaluation. Now we are kind of trying to predict against the six months and see if I predict on the first month out of those six months, uh, what is the kind of predictions in terms of actual versus prediction? What is the accuracy I'm achieving using this model? Okay, so let's go back to the evaluation screen. So here I can choose evaluation. I can look at the evaluation results. Okay, so this was the same model that we're looking at, 22 features, a couple of thousand records. Uh, we can look at the performance here. So this will, because this is still evaluating, this is not on the future data, which is a prediction job. So we have three different steps here, training, evaluation, and prediction, okay? So we are in the second step right now, which is the evaluation part. Here we took the six months of data, we tried to predict against it, and as you see, we have predicted 118 exits. These are the number of exits we are predicting, um, and you know, out of that, uh, 42 of the exits we are able to correctly predict, and 76 are not. So out of six, in those six months, Maybe there are like 118 exits that took place. And out of those 118, we were able to predict 42 in, a, in the right way. Um, similarly, there is a prediction accuracy for class 0 2, which is like the non-attrition records. So if you see the overall accuracy is 79%, uh, the precision is a bit lower, recall is okay. Uh, so definitely some kind of, some more work has to be done here in terms of the model tuning. This, there could be multiple reasons to it. You may, we may be missing a very important feature or maybe a transform feature has not been transformed correctly. There could be data issues. There could be tuning problems. It, it could have at least five to 10 different things that we have to look upon, okay? Similarly, in evaluation phase as well, you can look at the feature weights. So we kind of calculate the feature weights to make sure, because if I want to know that, okay, if this prediction is wrong and why it is wrong, then the answer lies really in the feature weights. Feature weights will tell me exactly why model has predicted what it has predicted, okay? And based upon that, now I can reverse track and see is it really the case in my data? Is it a data issue or is it a reality? Okay, uh, it's quite possible that we predicted that a person is going to leave the organization, but he or she may not have left yet and it may happen in future. So just because we predicted somebody is going to leave and he has not left, 
doesn't mean he's not going to doesn't mean that person is not going to leave right so you may want to increase your horizon to see but this may be a potential candidate i mean we cannot no model in the world can predict every candidate like to the high, highest accuracy like 100% accuracy but you know some of them are going to be 100% accurate and some of them going to be potentially possible exits so i think uh, that's pretty much it so what happens at the end is as i said we have to create some kind of visualizations um, and the visualization is the final step so let's look at one of the visualization here uh, we have built a sample dashboard here which allows the business user to look at the actual predictions etc they would like to compare how many employees are there how many exits have actually taken place how many are more predicted to be in line uh, and they may want to slice and dice this data in various fashions right so i'm just waiting for this uh, uh, the dashboard to be populated so this dashboard has around like seven or eight visualizations and each visualization is running independently right now uh, once you know the data comes back it will start rendering it so as you see as i was talking about right i mean just building a model is one piece in the puzzle but if you really think if you call an aml application because aml model is one thing and aml application is another thing the difference between the model and the application is model is just one part of the application but there are 10 steps before and 10 steps after and the beauty of this platform is going to allow you uh, to build all these steps like you know from start to end using a single platform if you want to build i mean obviously one can build their own platform but it will take like Uh, many many months to build such a platform which has got all the components or you will have to uh, bring together like maybe eight or 10 different tools or maybe like at least five to six different tools to stitch everything together right okay so we can see here what is the total head count the current head count uh, some of the plots are still coming up so here i see the total head this is the total head count this is the current head count uh, how many attritions have taken place what is the prediction now this is a prediction like you know we have ran the model multiple times that's why you see a much higher number but i think the total predictions were around like 118 out of 55 um then you can also look at you know the various uh, slice and dice by vintage by uh, you know by age and department and so on okay let's quickly go back to the uh, to the slides now this is the overall platform architecture of inferix as you see like we have we can talk to various sources at the bottom uh, all the way from file system databases hadoop cloud real time apis etc and then you know in the center the box it shows you all the modules that are available as a part of the platform there it can be used by data engineers data analysts and data scientists okay so that brings us to the end of this uh, uh, demo or webinar um i'm going to now open up for q and a uh, sharath can you please uh, message me the uh, like you know the the questions okay so i see one question here so the question is about how long it takes to build an enterprise uh, aml application like the the one which we just showed uh well that's a good question i think it just depends there are some ifs and buts on this so it depends upon the amount of data that you're doing right so this particular use case we were dealing with couple of thousand records but if your organization has millions of employees then obviously the 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 amount of time it requires to analyze that data like exploring the data training the model itself going through multiple iterations of tuning that can take some time it could be a bit cumbersome uh, also it depends upon what is the quality of your data if the quality is too bad we may have to fix many things and we'll have to do a lot of lot more trial and error because sometimes you have to impute the bad data when you are trying to impute there are different assumptions and based upon the assumption you will get an outcome if the outcome is not good you have to go back to your assumption right so it's a back and forth process so but typically i would say it should take somewhere between 2 to 3 months if you are trying kind of fully dedicated on it uh, and that's only the model building part of it okay but if you were using a platform like ours where you want to build the model bring the data also build the visualization etc like the whole gadget then i think it should be somewhere in the range of like you know 3 to 4 months where you know different teams can work in parallel the data engineers the data scientists and the business users uh, to bring the whole picture together okay uh okay we can take one more question here uh so the next question is about the uh, you know the 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 to be allowed to code using this platform uh so there is no screen as such where you can code in this platform it's a very configurable platform the whole point is about making you efficient um and you know scalable at the same time so whatever you build uh 
so keeping that in mind no there is no screen as such but if you want to port something of your own like a, you know a script or something there is an option where you can uh, execute the script as a one of the step in the platform then it kind of becomes like a black box uh, step because the model is because the platform is not aware what is happening inside the script but rather i would say like if you uh, you can still script out what you are trying to do with your existing models and then kind of try to configure those models into the platform because the platform will allow you to keep a track of changes like versioning etc also look at the results in a very visual manner and then kind of uh, you know be very transparent and auditable uh, so i think if you want to port your existing models in the form of a script that is an option uh, and then going forward you can start configuring things rather than you know making it a black box execution okay there is one more question uh, okay so i'll read out the question the question is uh, is there a way to export these models out of the platform yes there is a way to export the models uh, out of the platform so there is a special format called pmml which is a predictive markup modeling language this pmml will allow is very much like an xml which will allow you to export your model in the form of an xml and then once you export this model as pmml you will be able to uh, take it to the next environment or the next tool uh wherever you want to deploy this uh, because it's a commonly used format across all platforms okay okay um one other question okay so the question is like is this platform available for use to try it out uh, to build this models yes uh, uh so the answer is yes it is available you can send us a request uh, either you can send the email to contact us or infrix.com or you can go to our website and you can uh look for sign up for trial over there you just you just have to fill your information we'll create an account for you on the cloud and you will be able to kind of you know come and register and then start using the platform so we give you some credits on aws to use our platform uh once you're out of those credits you can buy more credits to continue using the platform or if you want to install this on prem then you know we can work with one of our sales team who would be happy to come out and give you a demo and give an estimate you know cost estimate Okay so I don't see any more questions thanks a lot everyone thanks for your time and attending the webinar uh, would appreciate if there is any feedback you want to provide through email or you know just contact us uh, would be happy to help you okay uh, have have a safe everyone thank you